just about a minute in from 4.35. So I'll get, we are live streaming to Facebook. Uh, Facebook group gets quite a bit of uh, engagement here. We have about 9,000 members in our Facebook group. And then, um, of course, people who are watching this live webinar will also have the recording available to everyone. Um, tonight, uh, this afternoon, we have Larry with Walker and Dunlop. Uh, Walker and Dunlop, if you're not familiar with them, they're a large uh, provider financing services. Um, what I'm reading, as of 2020, they had 900 employees and uh, over a million or over a billion with a B in revenue. That was as of 2020. And I know they have grown since then. That was a public data I was able to pull. Uh, Larry specifically leads the uh, debt front on them. But uh, as you heard us talking here, he does uh, source some equity on the prep side as well. Um, he's we're due looking at about $60 million right now at, in 2023 that we have with Walker and Dunlop, you know, sizing up with a couple of deals right now for 2023. And areas that helped us uh, throughout the past couple of years. So I'm um, excited to have you uh, speak to our uh, group here. I, I just try to keep up, Brian, with you and Justin and George and Eric and the team. So pleasure to be here. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah, if, if I didn't, uh, anything as far as your bio that you wanted to also mention on there that you. Uh, no, nah, uh, we're not, we're not here to talk about my bio. Let's talk about, let's talk about the market or. Transition. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, I have it open here. So if you guys think of any questions throughout this, if you see, if you want us to stop and expand more on a certain topic, go ahead. Um, pretty sure the chat feature is enabled. So, um, go right into it well there brian you kind of have a sense of what you'd like us to cover or you know do we want to start with any questions or any particular area here to you know obviously here to talk about multifamily finance but um another good question what, um sure. you know really hot topic right now obviously uh, you know, just start start us off with like when you know we hear about this in the news all the time. Like when the feds are raising rates, um, what exactly does that mean? Like when you hear the feds are raising rates again, uh, rates are going up. What exactly does that mean, and how does that affect multifamily buyers? Great question, Justin. So when the feds are raising rates, they're raising short term rates, and when the Fed funds rate increases, you know, like 25 basis points last week or 0.25%. That's an, that's an immediate increase in other short-term indices. So prime goes up when the Fed funds rate goes up. Um, SOFR goes up when the Fed funds rate goes up. Uh, so a, a, a rate hike is a short-term rate increase. Contrast that with long-term fixed rate money that is tied to treasuries, five, seven, 10 year treasuries are the, are the three most common durations. Um, treasuries do not move when, when the Fed's fund rate is, is increased. Treasuries are um, at market daily and there's just different forces that, uh, that, that, that drive how that's set. So, and, and I guess I'm not, Super aware of the of the range of the audience here, but I would share in, in, in commercial mortgages when you talk about rates, you're typically talking about pricing that's set as index plus spread. So if you're a floating rate borrower and you have a loan, it is going to be tied to SOFR or Prime or some other floating rate index, and it'll be that index plus a spread on the index equals your interest rate. Similarly, if you're borrowing a as a 10-year fixed rate borrower, your index would be the 10-year treasury and then index plus a spread, say 200 basis points equals your interest rate when you rate lock. So if the 10-year treasury is at three and a half percent, you know, and a, you have a 200 spread, your interest rate is five and a half percent at rate lock. What, is the, what exactly is, is the spread, Larry? Obviously there, there's the index, the lender, chooses that nobody can control what is what is that spread in there it's baked in right so there's a there's a couple different parts to spread so with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for instance there's uh there's a there's a guarantee and servicing 
piece of spread, which is um, the guarantee fee is what Fannie Mae makes on a loan. Servicing is what the Fannie Mae licensee or dust lender um, realizes as servicing revenue during the life of the loan. And then there's also an investor spread, which is what it sounds like. It's the revenue that the investor is realizing during the life of the loan. And you put all of those three together and you get your credit spread or, you know, where index plus credit spread equals interest rate. Awesome. And going off of that, what are like kind of touched on this in the beginning before the call, but I think it's a good topic tonight as well. What are like, you know, briefly just some different loan products that uh, sponsors can go out and, and finance their, their deals with? Well, again, great question. So the the most common well, at, at a at the highest level, I would uh, oh, okay. differentiate between fixed rate and floating rate. So that's your that's your that's your biggest distinction. Are you fixed or floating? Um, and within that, are you, you know, floating is what it sounds like. You're resetting your loan pricing is resetting. Um, you know, whenever your floating rate index moves. In the case of Prime, that could be in a daily or anytime there's a change in the Fed funds rate. With SOFR, that's a usually tied to a either 30 or 90 day SOFR index. So you're resetting every month or three months on your rate. Um, sorry, let me ask me the question again, Justin. So I want to stay on, on top. Like, you know, different loan products sponsors can choose uh, okay. finance or deals with. Obviously, yep. Yeah, there's bridge loans, uh, permanent debts. And on, the, and on the perm debt side, again, very high level. Uh, if you want a three or five year fixed rate loan, that tends to be a bank or credit union product, or the, the banks or credit unions are best at that product. There are some other places to get it, but that's really the, the sweet spot. Seven, 10, 12 year fixed um, is gonna tend to be agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or capital markets, whether it's CMBS or, or, or life insurance companies um, as other sources. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that a credit union or bank can't do a seven year loan, they can, in many instances. And a lot of times I would add that the, the banks or credit unions, what they're doing on longer term fixed rate is they're actually giving you a floating rate loan and forcing you to buy, or forcing is not the right word, requesting, requiring you to buy a swap to convert their floating rate loan to a to fixed rate and remove interest rate risk on that loan. But, you know, so as a bar where you're thinking about, am I floating or am I fixed? And then if I'm fixed, uh, you know, three to five year duration or seven, 10, you know, or longer term duration. One thing that I would also note for borrowers who are coming into the business or transitioning maybe upstream from uh, more of a single family or, or, or housing development background is that um, on, on multifamily loans, fixed rate loans have a prepayment penalty. They have a prepayment restriction. Depending on the execution, that can be step down or it can be yield maintenance or defeasance. So that's a little different than what you may be accustomed to seeing on the residential side of the business. And that's a, also a big reason why borrowers historically have wanted to be floating rate in some instances rather than fixed rate, because they either have no prepayment penalty or a set, you know, half point, one point exit fee, and that's it. You, you don't have that on, if you do a 10 year fixed rate loan with, with agencies or CMBS or life companies, you're gonna have some sort of yield maintenance or other call protection on that loan. Yeah, so I mean, floating rates, obviously like a very, you know, hot topic in the last two years um, is, you know, if a, if a past investor sees a deal with a, a floating rate debt on it, again, it has kind of like a, like a bad, uh, you know, it's name. All, it's, a, it's, a, it's, only, it's only bad in the last year, Justin. The reality yeah, is I mean, 15 years before that, you were better off floating than fixed for all 15 years, but not, 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 up, not, yeah. like not in the past year. Yeah. So like if a spot, if, somebody, if an investor sees a deal with a floating rate, is it automatically yeah. bad, stay away? Or like, I can't, you know, kind of like what you just said, but why would a sponsor ever want to do floating rate debt? 
Well, floating rate debt's appealing if you can if you can execute a business plan in an expedited manner because because there's no so there, there's two main reasons why you would do floating rate debt, and it all has to do with value add. So um, a fixed rate loan, a lender is simply funding the loan. You get all the dollars at close, and 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 you go down the road, and it's fully baked. A floating rate loan. Bar was typically in a floating rate loan in a situation where there's a value add component. It doesn't have to be ground up construction, but you know, you're renovating units, you're re-entitling a portion of the property to add additional buildings or do other things, and you want to have a, you want to have draws on your loan. You, um, so because your loan balance is changing during the loan term, the loan is set up as a floating rate loan. So you have draws and your balance resets. At you know at dip, at current interest rates through the process, um, if there's enough value add, and the value add can occur in a relatively finite period, one, two, maybe three years, then a floating rate loan makes all the sense in the world because you um, and especially the the more value add there is, the more a floating rate loan makes sense because let's say that you're buying a ten million dollar property. And your fixed rate loan is just to make the math easy. It's a, you know sixty five percent of loan to value, so you're borrowing six and a half million. You need three and a half million of equity. The same ten million dollar property, if you're if you're spending you know two million dollars on renovations, you know that's a twelve million dollar capitalization. You wouldn't want a six and a half million dollar loan only. You know if you could get an an eight and a half million dollar bridge loan or nine million dollar bridge loan. Um, so, you, you know, bridge makes your equity go further. Um, and the reason, another reason people do bridge is, look, a, a perm loan is rear view mirror based underwriting. It's based on your current in place rent roll and cash flow and your trailing operating expenses. A bridge loan, you know, bridge lenders will underwrite off your pro forma income. So they will look ahead and say, all right, we have, you know, $500,000 of in-place cash flow today, but in three years, Justin and Brian are gonna have $800,000 of in-place cash flow. So we'll size our bridge off of that 800,000, you know, and we're gonna, our diligence is gonna be about confirming the rents that are gonna get you in that example from 500,000 to 800,000 after renovation or after adding additional units. And then, you know, looking at, at, at market expenses. And if you're going to have that kind of growth in cash flow, you wouldn't want to be locked into a perm loan day one because you'd have an enormous amount of trapped equity then in the project and, and just take a lot of equity going in. Um, so long answer, but that's that's why people go bridge. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, like the bridge loan is more flexible, like how you mentioned in the beginning. You can usually exit when you want. You know, if you execute your business plan, uh, you know, the value is increased, you can exit the property, um, you know, when you want to, when it's, you know, optimal time for you and your investors. Well, well, Justin, as you and Brian see, you know, these renovation projects, multifamily renovation is, is there's a lot going on, you know, and, and so your, your property, um, it's very hands-on and, and your cash flow uh, can, can vacillate, you know, up and down as you're executing your business plan. I mean, if you buy a 300 unit property and you're going to renovate 300 units, you're going to have 20 or 30 or 40 units offline at any given time as you're doing the renovation, even just as as individual units roll. And that, you know, that has an impact on your cash flow until you get those units back online. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, and, and y'all may want to talk about this because something Elevate's done, uh, something else in, in, in some instances on fixed rate, Justin, is, is assuming an existing loan, which is also something that's popular today with where, you know, with the change that's happened on rates. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. We've, uh, we've assumed two, uh, two loans now, I guess, with uh, closing a phase one and two of watercolors, and then also a townies, we had uh, two assumptions there, which were, were nice given the current environment. Right. Where you where you get the benefit of yesterday's rate on that on that assumed loan rather than you know today's pricing. We had uh, some questions are coming into the uh, Facebook group that I'm monitoring. And someone said, uh, "Any thoughts on creative finance?" Um, so, creative finance. I mean, 
creative finance is great. So what does creative finance typically mean? Typically means some form of, of sell or carry, you, you know, or a lot of times. So then, the, then a lot of that depends on, you know, does a seller own a property unlevered? Or, you know, or do, or do they or do they have leverage that's got to be paid off? So if they own a property unlevered, you know, that's just kind of whatever you and they, uh, uh, you know, agree on. Um, and let me let me touch on that for a sec because depending on the size of the property, so you you could. Um, let's talk about perm loans here, Fannie and Freddie agency financing for a second. So if you're at if you're at full leverage today, we're, we're at max leverage. Those metrics are uh, a one point on conventional kind of five, six million and above loan amounts. Those metrics are a 125, 1.25 debt service coverage ratio and 80% and, and loan to value um, is the maximum leverage you can achieve. Your pricing gets better if you, if you lower the leverage. So if we go from a 125 debt service cover to a 135 debt service coverage ratio and a max of 65 loan to value, our pricing improves by 25 basis points. If we further drop down to a 155 debt service coverage ratio and 55 loan to value, our pricing improves by another 20 to 30 basis points. So, so the same property, same cash flow, if you drop your leverage, you can end up with a loan that's 50 to 70 basis points better priced um, by reducing leverage. So um, just, you know, if, if you have a seller that's willing to take back, you know, a million dollars and they'll do it as, as pref equity in a manner an agency will accept or, the, or in, in a manner that a bank or otherwise will accept, you can get better terms on your senior mortgage and, uh, and increase your, um, and increase your returns. One other example on that at full leverage, you know, a Fannie Mae loan will be on a 30 year amortization. We may only get two years of interest only at, at, at low to moderate leverage. We're delegated at least half term interest only at low leverage. We're delegated full term interest only. So the difference in cash flow between I'm on a 30 year amortization and I'm full term interest only fixed is, you know, is, is material um, and, and something to, to consider. Um, I did another question. Another question came out. What are the basic parameters uh, Fannie or agency is, looks for on supplemental? DSCR requirements, LTV restrictions, anything else on right. supplemental? Great question. question. So a supplemental mortgage is a, um, uh, it's a, it's a second loan from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac that leaves the a second trustee that or second lien that that leaves the existing senior loan in place. So you do not incur any any pre. It's a second bite at the apple. There's no pre. There's no payoff of the existing loan. Um, and it's just it's just cash out refinance proceeds. It's a very popular uh, aspect of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac multifamily financing. This is only about multifamily, five units and above. Um, so supplementals are underwritten to a slightly higher debt service coverage ratio. Uh, it kind of tracks where your senior mortgage is. So if the senior was at a 125 debt service coverage ratio, a supplemental would be at a 130. And a, and a supplemental pricing is current market pricing. Is there's a there's an adder, so it's about eighty basis points, or call it one one more roundup. Call it one percent. Supplemental is one percent higher than a senior mortgage would be today. So if a senior mortgage is five and a quarter percent today, a supplemental would be six and a quarter, or a little bit lower. Is that just like more debt on top of your debt, Larry? Is that a good way to put it, or? It, it it is it's debt. So and and cash out proceeds are are not taxed. So what a supplemental allows you to do is if you're raising rents at your property, you know you, you get to you get to essentially rebalance your loan and and take additional um, take additional you know take cash out proceeds midterm on your loan. Yeah, you're, you're eligible for a supplemental anytime after twelve months. Okay. Assuming assuming you have enough cash flow, so it's it's really a it's a cash flow driven analysis. Got it. You see that more comment on value add deals, probably uh, maybe ground up. It's uh, well, Brian. It's really most common on um, on markets where you're getting a lot of rent growth because 
because the you have to have the perm loan in place in the in the first place to to get a supplemental. So you're not going to get a perm right out of the gate on on ground up or or a heavy value add. Typically, typically where you're going to get you're going to put a perm loan in place on a property that's stabilized, and then if you get if you get substantial rent growth, you know if you're in a market like South Florida that's been really hot. So you have a couple of years of five or six or seven percent rent growth. You know very quickly you're all that cash flows most of it's falling to the bottom line and uh and you're you know you're you're eligible for a supplemental um i mean you can get there on on lower expenses too but that's harder to do today yeah um we could talk about the loan that we're currently sizing up um what fanny is what we're going to um can't get it is uh too much into the details on the, the the deal itself, but we can talk about the loan. Um, well, okay, so let's talk about. Um, that's a great point. So, uh, if on a, on an acquisition, uh, the underwriting for a perm loan, whether it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or Capital Markets, meaning CMBS or or bank, what's getting looked at? So, on the on the income side, it's really current rent roll. I mean, we'll look at the last three months of collections to make sure that they track, but it's, it's on the income side, it's really your current rent roll, um, less any concessions that are, that are being given uh, on leases. On the, on the expense side, we're looking at a trailing 12 months um, and, and then making post-closing adjustments to key line items would be insurance, uh, and 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 where you are on a new policy, taxes, and what's expected on a on a tax reassessment post close, um, and then kind of market on a on a few key line items such as such as payroll. So I was I was at a meeting two weeks ago with the the second largest property management company in Seattle, and they were saying that two years ago, you know, payroll was about eight percent. Uh, of the of the effective gross is what they were seeing in that market, and today it's about eleven percent. And they're like, "That's the line item we're having the hardest time controlling on on bigger properties." So um, that's really that's really perm underwriting is uh, is adjusting expenses to market post close and uh, and 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 capturing what's really in place uh, on the income side, and then sizing to to for agency to, to debt service coverage metrics. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, there was one question in the chat, Brian, I don't know if you want to do that one. But... Uh, on, yeah. on, go ahead, guys. I understand that older existing rate caps can have an assignment or resale value. If yes. the subject property is going through a sale or refinance, if so, can you give a high level overview of the process and maybe how they are generally valued? Well, that's a, that's a little, that's outside of kind of what my team, I and my team do on a on. We're in lending, so the the the, the rate cap companies uh, are going to be your best source for that, and and those the leading companies that I would recommend um, the group look at are AST, Pensford, P E N S F O R D, um, Derivative Logic, and uh, and Chatham. So uh, some combination of those four firms, by the way, the, these rate cap firms all have good newsletters that summarize what they are seeing in the market. Um, and, and, and most of the newsletters are free. So, uh, you know, maybe Brian, afterward, you and I can circulate those names, but, but I, I reckon- yeah, I, put, I put them in the chat there. Chat, I've heard of chat. Perfect. I think Chatham is who we've used. Um, yep. So I think those are all good resources for sure. And 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 those firms typically uh, place the rate cap um, for the borrower, and those firms will, will give you market pricing on reselling the rate cap. Uh, and 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 that's really that, or or if the rate cap sometimes banks will do their own rate cap and you could have the dialogue directly with the bank. But 
but a lot of the banks use these external hedging firms um, and, uh, and I would recommend speaking with them. Another kind of question, Larry, you see uh, underwriting from a lot of different sponsors, a lot of uh, very well sophisticated borrowers. Underwriting is obviously a little bit subjective, like what one sponsor may think is conservative, may be aggressive to somebody else. What are like a few things that like really just stand out to you like in the past that you had to go back to the sponsor and say, hey, I don't think this is realistic. I think this is a little aggressive. Yeah. Um, like what are like a few unique qualities like in their underwriting that you saw that kind of just uh, didn't sit well? Well, well Justin, this, I mean, the sponsor's always right. Come on. I mean, I, you know, in my, uh, in my world, you get paid to close loans. So you're trying to figure out, you know, how to That's make true. it, yeah. how to make it work. And, and acquisitions are tough. I mean, it's, 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 it's just very competitive out there. So trying to make transactions pencil, not easy, but you know, the, the collaborative effort and the, and the dialogue around, how to how to make the numbers work, you know, on the income side, really on the on the whole on the whole pro forma model, the biggest single discussion is around trends. Okay, inevitably sponsors are saying, hey, in such and such market, I'm getting you know, whatever five percent rent growth, whatever the number is, and perm lenders and even most bridge lenders are they're just not going to underwrite organic 5% rent growth. Um, and then sometimes you get this, this, this mismatch of, Hey, my, my income is going to rise four or 5%, you know, but my expenses are only going to rise one or 2%. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it ends up being a big Delta when you lay that out over five years or much, you know, much less 10 years, those assumptions. So you know, those are those are tough to work with. And, and where there's where there's really friction, again, back to an example I used earlier, if you back up, you know, a year or two or three ago in some of these really hot markets, the Nashvilles and Miamis and Austins of the world, you know, sponsors are absolutely getting that rent growth. So when you if you're dealing with an on market transaction that's being, you know, um, brought to market by a sophisticated investment sales brokerage team, you know, they're going to be messaging to you as a buyer that, hey, we have other buyers that are underwriting this level of rent growth. And if you're not underwriting that level of rent growth, your returns are going to be compressed as a result. And you may not be competitive in your bid. Um, and so then you can end up with a disconnect where, you know, you as an equity investor are comfortable with certain assumptions that your lender says, well, we, we can't, you know, Freddie Mac won't let us underwrite that. And, and it's not that anyone's right or wrong, but then you get into, yeah. okay, is this, is this equity risk or debt risk? Because on the debt side, you know, the upside is, hey, you, we get repaid in full, you know, plus interest and that's it. You know, the equity is, hey, you know, we get all the, you know, to the moon um, and, and certain dollars are better uh, from a risk adjustment perspective as, as, as equity dollars than as, than as debt dollars. I mean, that's really the, the discussion. I think the other, um, you know, on the expense side, um, most operators do not today. If, if I had to say one, the one line on them that people are just off on today is insurance. Insurance has changed dramatically in Texas, Florida, and many other states. And, um, and an operator who hasn't repriced their insurance in, in, in six months, um, they're off in their in their assumption and they're in for a surprise when they go get you know bids um, yeah i mean we're hearing that you know across the board like insurance costs are up like crazy taxes of course uh payroll and you know many markets is substantially up um you know in, in, in my opinion like it doesn't really make sense to continue underwriting those things on a year over year growth at that two three four percent i mean because it is growing like five, eight, nine percent year over year. So, well, the, really well, difficult to kind of uh, underwrite to that when you know, like the, the data is there showing that it's growing at that nine, ten percent. Yeah, if you're in, if you're in, again, using two of the most active transaction states. If you're in Texas or Florida, you you have to get your insurance quote early in the process, so there's no surprise because it's it's a it's a big number. 
um, compared to where it has been. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, we touched on it a little bit at the beginning of the call, but what are you seeing uh, like regional banks? It seems like, um, you know, a lot of we have a mix of active investors and passive investors here who, you know, we've we've gone to regional banks before and, you know, we're seeing, you know, somewhat of a pullback there. It seems like what are you? Yeah, right. what are you seeing? That, that's a great question, Brian. I want to I want to go back to the conversation with Justin just for one second. So what what. Um, but I would encourage sponsors to think about on, on underwriting and, and, in, and in presenting an opportunity to lenders. And the, you know, the team at Elevate knows this well. So the, the keys, just the basics. You want, to know your, you want to know your current rent roll. You want a trailing 12-month operating statement. Because every lender in multifamily is super sensitive to how's a property trending. And sooner or later, they're going to want to see an actual trailing 12-month operating history. And then you want a, a, a pro forma or budget for at least the next year. You know, the question is going to be, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, when you buy the property, how's the property going to run, you know, looking forward for one year? And, and, and as a sponsor, you need to be able, if you're an active sponsor, you need, you need to have that information more or less at your fingertips. If there's a renovation plan, you know, put a stake in the ground and, and get your renovation budget, you know, set as best you can. Uh, things change, but but you don't want to not have it at your fingertips. So um, those things, I, I think, are 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 just kind of that's your ante to you know sit at the table and play. Uh, and it's surprising how many sponsors aren't kind of ready on those items. And then that's you know a, a red red flag um, or a yellow flag. You still want to try to figure out how to help them. But uh, so Brian, back to back to your note on um, on banks. So, you know, the, the, the bank market is, is very choppy today and, but, but banks are still lending. I mean, I, you know, I lost a transaction today uh, in LA to, um, to, uh, uh, to Chase at uh, Chase's quote was 5.8% on a step down prepay, you know, I owe good quote um, on a, you know, bite size deal, $3 million loan in West Hollywood. So, Banks are still they're out there um, and and active and banks are always the largest market share of multifamily larger than Fannie Freddie uh, you know but the issue on the regional bank side is that a lot of the banks don't have don't have liquidity and they're not really in business unless you're a long established repeat customer and or unless you're bringing new capital as deposits so if you just want to transact a one-off loan, um, you're going to need to have, you're probably going to want to engage a mortgage broker because you're going to need to have, or or you're going to want to um, cast a little wider net and have a conversation with four, five, six, eight lenders in your market, banks and credit unions. Uh, don't sleep on credit unions. Th that's, a, that's a very good source of capital for, especially for loan amounts under 10 million. But you're gonna okay. you're gonna need to run the traps on four, six, or eight options like that. Probably not just make one phone call. What one other thing on credit unions? So what, credit unions are almost always recourse, but in exchange for recourse, the federal credit unions typically do not have a prepayment penalty at all. So okay. then then you get into the question of, well, how afraid of am I about recourse? And you know. I sell non-recourse financing for a living, but I would say in many instances, sponsors overestimate the value of non-recourse. Like recourse, when, what is the circumstance where you're going to give the keys back? You know what I mean? You have to think about that. Like how sideways would a transaction have to go that your equity would be complete? If you're a low to moderate leverage borrower in a, in a top 40 or 50 MSA you know, that has population growth, I mean, it's just hard to envision the circumstance where you can't lower rents by two hundred dollars and fill up all your units and stay afloat. If you're if you're at moderate leverage, so yeah. um, anyway, we digress. But that's a uh, just a, a note for the audience. Or yeah, I mean, if you're in a you know well located market, growing market, I mean, location is key, obviously. But yeah, hard to imagine 
the property, you know, dipping down to 40, 50% occupancy, whatever, unless there's, uh, you know, like in a very extreme Big, bigger, case bigger or something forces, going on. Bigger forces yeah. in play. That's right. Yeah, exactly. But you, and you know, and you see that, and that's a real bigger forces in play. I can tell you in the capital markets right now, uh, there are a number of lenders playing in larger loans that that are that are not really going to do anything in Chicago and San Francisco right now. They just they see bigger forces in play in those two markets, and you know they're not going to say to you they're redlined. But as a practical matter, if you're trying to get a loan in in you know a, a commercial loan in Chicago or San Francisco right now, good luck, good luck. Like the wind is super in your face. Well, yeah, we're not going to any of those markets anytime soon. So, no, that work is there. <laughs> a lot of better choices out there. Yeah. Larry, you kind of touched on this all already, like in similar points, but, you know, I guess, like, if anybody was like a passive investor, I mean, like, what are some things they can look for and kind of like vet, like on the deal analysis side? I mean, you're, you're a numbers guy, you're a deal analysis guy. Um, like what, what would like stand out to you as far as like the numbers, the analysis for somebody to like really look out for? Well, the big, so the biggest thing in, in, in value add multifamily investing, Justin, is, uh, does the sponsorship have track record? Can they actually execute? Because it's, it's easy to get the numbers down. And pay, I mean, the numbers in paper, that's the easy part. And I say that, and I, you know, I arm wrestle with people all day, every day in different ways and try to, you know, that's my job, but. But that's not the hard part of the business. The hard part of the business is actually doing it. Is actually doing it. That's right. Whether it's whether it's renovating or simply, you know, running these, it's it's not that easy to run a property at you know stable at 95 plus percent. I mean, it's it's impossible to run a 300 unit property at 98% occupancy. You just you can't get tenants in and out of the units, you know, fast enough. And you, you have okay. units where things happen. You have a unit that goes down or you have a roof leak and you have three units that go down and, and it takes, you know, it can take you, if you have to get a permit or get a unit reinspected, you know, or a building reinspected, you could, you could, you could be offline for weeks or months. And, uh, and, and just the, just the, the blocking and tackling is, is super underrated um, as a, as a passive sponsor in terms, as a passive investor, determining which sponsor to execute with. So I would, I would focus on that. Like that's, that's number one. <laughs> can, can, can you really do what you're telling me, you know, in your pro forma, you're going to do. Um, okay. And then, you know, the other, I, I, I think is, is just determining um, investment duration. So I am actually, uh, I haven't coordinated with the Elevate team here. I don't want to say anything that you know doesn't align with their business plan. But it's my own personal view. My personal view is that IRR is not a great metric uh, for most investments. I don't like IRR because IRR is very time sensitive and it can be manipulated. And IRR, you end up if you're a, if you're an IRR driven investor, your incentives are not totally aligned with a lot of operator incentives. So if I'm an operator and I'm getting a promote above a certain IRR, my incentive as the operator is to, is to round trip that transaction as quickly as possible because that's gonna inflate the IRR. So there's two problems with that. The, the, the first problem is, so my incentive as the operator is to get in and out of the deal as fast as I can. And, and then as an investor, <laughs> you know, I don't want my money back in 18 months. I want I want a good deal that my money stays in for a long time, for you know, seven, 10, 12 years. Like I don't, you know, the last thing I want to do is put my money in a good deal. Have you give me my money back 18 months later? The market's changed, and now I've got to either pay taxes or go redeploy in 18 months in a new deal in a different interest rate environment or whatever. Like so. I, you know, good point. I tend to look at a, at a, if I'm a passive investor, I'm looking at um, markets that I want to be in with sponsors who I want to be there with and, and looking more at a, at a multiple or, or a, just a, you know, different um, absolute return metrics um, that are not as time sensitive 
uh, would be would be my take because you can't no nobody invests in real estate for you, you can't make a twenty five IRR on a ten year hold that's just not that doesn't that doesn't work so you got you got to bring that that expectation down anyone who's giving you mid twenties IRRs they're exiting you in in two to three years. Excellent point. And I've heard that from some investors, um, but, you know, like they're looking for a, you know, long-term cash flowing asset, whereas, you know, the sponsor is, you know, incentivized to exit successfully, uh, possibly sooner than the actual hold period. Um, and yes, like they're promote uh, incentivized as well. Um, so on one hand, like if you just keep returning the capital back to the investor, they just have the same problem every 18 to 24 months, just trying to find somewhere else to park their capital. Uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, it's not a bad problem to double your money uh, every every two to three years. I mean, that's kind of a, a good problem to have. But uh, yeah, at the same time, I, I, I can see both uh, perspective on it for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's not a, there's not a right or wrong answer. But, no, there's uh, not. I'm all about the equity multiples myself. You know, that's like generally what I'm looking at for sure. And yeah. like the IRR, you know, yeah, if I can double my money in two to three years, heck yeah. But I think, you know, general business plan, IR, like just if you exit and return a little bit of money early on, your IRR gets inflated up um, versus a longer hold. Sure. Um, you know, speaking on that equity multiple, what's, uh, I guess it just depends on, there's not really any right or wrong leverage as far as more the investor appetite for risk. You know, for me, I, I'm on the equity side and, you know, I'll take as much leverage as I'm trying to increase my equity multiple. I'll go, you know, sure. as high as we can, you know, and then, you know, I, you might have the opposite of that. Dave Ramsey, no debt, you know, where not leveraging uh, at all. So I think, I don't know where you see, you know, it seems like 80% is like the common, like kind of threshold. Some, some investors might want a little bit more. Some investors want, might want a little less. 80%? 80%. Well, you're, th you're talking about bridge. I'm yeah. I mean, side. yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. I, I'd say blend it like, you know, so for example, our, our most recent deal we're sizing up, we might have uh, agency coming in at 65% and then we're bringing in pref equity, yep. you know, bringing that in just over 80% right. on the leverage. Right. Well, well said, but there, but there's two, there's two components, you know, to the, to the, um, to the debt capital, if you will, uh, in that, because as a senior loan, um, you know, to, to your, your comment made me think about like one part of our borrower base are, um, our operators or developers who, uh, they get worn out on single family and they and they and they grow into multifamily. But that that transition is is a it's a big it's a big jump. Uh, and so they come into multifamily and they have financing expectations that are aligned with single family, which are which are different. And so like in today's world, it's very it's it's impossible, I would say, for for like a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan to get to 80% or you know even 75% because because cap rates depending on the market you're in I mean they're 5 to 5 and a half on stable you know multis maybe 475 maybe 5 and 3 quarters but you know like a, a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac loan right now is multifamily is going to be priced in the 5 and a quarter to 5 and a half range you know just generally um, and so you don't have much positive leverage, even if, even if I can get to full term IO, like you're, you're not getting buying a five and a half cap deal with five and a half percent debt, you know, it's not really enhancing your returns year one. It will over time, if you get the rent growth and you grow your cash flow, but not year one. And so inevitably, you know, that 125 debt service cover, uh, without positive leverage is going to, is going to crimp your, your leverage on your senior mortgage and make it, you know, less compelling. That said, Brian, like Elevate is doing a lot of transactions that are 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar transactions. You know, I mean, with all respect to Dave Ramsey, no, nobody does those without leverage. I mean, there's, there's leverage on it. E even if people buy them all cash, they, they put leverage on them 
after the fact, very few sit unlevered. Larry, do you see any positive leverage deals in this environment? I mean, you're looking at deals from sponsors all across the country, I imagine. Uh, I mean, do you see like any positive leverage deals? Well, um, you know, Justin, what would you view as the as the year one cap rate on, you know, on, on Rapid City? Uh, low five. Yeah. 5.2. Yeah. So we, so we would be, we would be just barely positive leverage, you know, and that's in a, year that's one. in a, that's in a tertiary market year one. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, and that's, and that's really the example for, for the audit. I mean, that's, you, you got to get into markets where you can buy at a cap rate year one and cap rate is kind of a, Subjective. The term cap rate, and they're referring to a lot of different things. Is that yeah. cap rate on buyer's number or cap rate on seller's number? You know, tax adjusted. Uh, correct. Correct. So <laughs> people talk about cap rate like there's this uniform number. It's it's a little bit of Agreed. a Agreed. Um, yes. But but what I would say to the group is on you know if you're buying a turnkey asset today, you're going to be buying on your adjusted cap rate somewhere in the probably in the five to five and a half range. And, you know, you, you may be able to get a small amount of positive leverage, um, but small meaning like 25 bips. I'm not seeing more than that anywhere right wow. now. I mean, the, 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 the investment sales world guys, tr transactions are, are off 50 plus percent. So all of the major brokerage firms, if you make a living on, on, on investment sales, um, all the major brokerage firms, revenues are down, you know, there's been headcount reductions, you, you know, investment sales velocity is way down because buyers and sellers, there's a, there's a big gap. Um, and, and, and the reason for that gap is that debt moves right away. Uh, and, and, and then equity has to take a lower return. And right now equity hasn't, you know, been willing to take that kind of return. So equities on the sidelines, especially institutional. And so the uh, the investment sales volumes, you know, from like, I mean, who are my competitors? Marks and Millichap, JLL, CBRE, Bercadia, Newmark, everybody's volumes are down um, because the, it's very hard to get positive returns. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, Brian, do you have anything else? Uh, Larry, appreciate your time. This is a great session. Yeah, for sure. That's really good. Um, I don't see any, you guys can feel free to add another message if you want, but we covered a lot. The recording will be available. We'll post that up on the, the YouTube channel for everybody and send that out. Um, yes, Ram, we, we will send out the recording. Um, I guess uh, closing, I mean, interest rates, you know, where do you, I mean, if you had a crystal ball, you know, where do you see interest rates well, go? I, I think the Fed kind of, it seems like they're going to settle now, you know, maybe, maybe another. So it's such a good question, Brian. And, and I really encourage the group, like follow these hedging firms because there's two things you can do. First of all, like derivative logic and their newsletter this week, they were pretty emphatic that, that Fed's funds rate is not going to be reduced this year. They may be wrong. They may be right. I don't know. But they're in the business and they kind of lay out why they think there will be no rate cuts on the short term rates through the end of the year. Second is several of the of the websites and Chatham is probably the best. They give you forward curves and you can choose the forward curve on whichever index you want. Five, seven, 10 year treasury, 30 day SOFR, et etc. So you can see not just one person's opinion or one firm's opinion, you can see market consensus on where rates are going. Chatham, if you scroll further down the page, they actually show you how market consensus has compared with what's actually happened historically. So, you know, market consensus is worth what it's worth, but it does give you kind of a, you know, a feel for what people think is going to happen. My personal view is that, uh, is that, you know, rates, don't go down much for a while for various reasons. That's my sense. And, and, and I think that, uh, that the market, you know, 
asset prices and cash flows. I mean, I think we still have inflation. I think that rents are going to continue to go up. I think that's, you know, the saving grace of multi, the strength of multifamily is uh, I don't see many markets where there's rent deceleration, you know, and uh, and if your income holds up on multifamily, um, you know, deals work over time. So great. Richard asks, uh, what about assumptions? Are you seeing very many? Um, we just assumed, uh, Elevate just assumed a loan, uh, Fannie loan for our Northwest Arkansas deal, uh, January 1st. That was 3.49% uh, Fannie Mae assumption. There was nine years left on the term, one year left of interest only. Yeah. Um, as far as new acquisitions, I don't know that We've seen a lot. I mean, we like it. We like the ability to assume, you know, um, I haven't, I mean, you see it uh, sometimes advertised in the OMs if there is assumptions, you know, that's kind of like a selling point to the deal is that there's an assumption, this, the loan is assumable and that, you know, increases the price. Um, but we did one other assumption in 2022. Um, but what about you, Larry? Are you seeing a lot of assumptions or what? Yeah. And Brian, for the reasons you're talking about, if you, if there's existing financing, that's, you know, three and a half, four, whatever, even four and a half, it's lower than what you're going to get on a new loan today. So if you can, if you can make the leverage work, maybe with a supplemental, maybe you just bring more equity. Um, sure. If you can assume a loan at 4% instead of getting a new loan today at five and a quarter, Absolutely. That's accretive to cash flow. Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of that happening. All right. That's it. That's all we got on the questions here. Yeah. I put Larry's contact info in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to him about their financing needs or just to pick his brain about uh, multifamily financing questions. Um, so I put his email in the chat there. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, Larry, really appreciate your time. Thanks for thank you. chatting with us tonight. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian, Justin. Pleasure. All right, guys. Have a good afternoon. Thanks again. Thank Bye-bye.